the stream itself will probably also be shared externally to uh, Buas later. So uh, don't share or say anything that you don't want to go uh, public. Um, Justin and I had a bit of a chance encounter. He's been doing some really cool development stuff, which he's showing on Twitter, which which I've been following for a while. And at some point, I reached out and we figured it might be nice to get um, to get him in for a talk about um, pre-production and, and your vision on game development. Um, so I'd say just take it away. And um, uh, how would you would you like to do with questions? Do you prefer if people raise hands, or do you want people to just interrupt? If they have a uh, question. So my deck is pretty short, like there's 10 slides, but they're really short slides. So I'll run through those and then I'm uh, planning to do kind of a, a demo of like the systems that I use. And um, I don't know that there'll be a lot of points that are that interesting to ask questions on the deck, but it's short enough that if people like, hey, on that slide where you said this. So maybe um, I'll go through the deck first and then everything after that is kind of open, like it's interactive. Perfect. So. Awesome. Um, yeah, Take so let me share my screen here. I'm just going to share my whole desktop because we're going to be switching back and forth between some stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm Justin Johnson. Um, I've been a software developer for um, most of my career, or at least that's how I've, uh, I guess, kind of identified. I've done a lot of uh, marketing and other things that intersect with software development. Um, but I have always had a passion for tech. And that really started for me when I was um, very young. A game came out called Super Mario Brothers, and my babysitter would play it. I think I was four years old when that came out. And it was like magic to me. Um, I, I kind of liked to play it. I was terrible because I was a little kid, but I was really fascinated by how it worked. And um, that, I feel like, has been kind of a driving factor um, for my whole life. Um, and so I never actually had a Nintendo. I never owned my own copy of Super Mario Brothers, but I would go home and draw out these elaborate levels on graph paper and imagine like building my own um, levels. And now, you know, 35 years later, I, I'm kind of doing the same thing. Um, and I set out to be a programmer. I, I started learning um, programming languages of that era when I was really young, um, but I was very um, not good at math. And uh, so I decided to go into graphic design instead and ended up being a programmer anyway. And um, part of the reason that happened is because of a program called, uh, at the time it was Macromedia. Now uh, it was bought out by Adobe, but it was Flash. And Flash really um, had this simple language that was really empowering for people who didn't learn or didn't know how to um, program in the sort of traditional education sense. And so I kind of taught myself that, and then that was this gateway to a whole um, different world of, of software development. And so really, I would say it's, I've come into software development from a weird path because I really came into it from the creative side. Whereas in my era, in, in the um, late eighties and nineties and into the early two thousands, software was very much an engineering domain. Um, but the thing that I've always loved about it is I feel like it really is a creative pursuit. It, it's a creative passion. And my favorite thing is um, bringing art to life and kind of giving worlds life uh, through code. So that's been kind of a big driving thing. These are some of the games that I've worked on. These are all uh, little indie games. I think in my bio that I sent to Renee, I said I had worked on six uh, shipped indie titles. I may have understated that. I think it's actually been more. And I've also worked on some larger titles just uh, on a contract basis. But these are some that I picked because they're relevant to what I want to talk about today. And um, they're also games that I'm the most proud of. I think the projects I'm the most proud of are not the ones that necessarily like made good money or were the biggest or had the most players, but they were the games where when we finished them, I just felt really good about how the game played and how it felt. So The Incredible Baron is on uh, Steam. My role on this project was actually really small. I built the um, backing Kickstarter system that unlocked the game for uh, people who had backed the game on Kickstarter. But the art and the game design of this is just beautiful. It's a really deep game. It's kind of a tower defense meets uh, 
has some kind of trading card game aspects where you build the team that you're going to use. Um, and then like real time strategy a little bit as well. And so it's uh, very deep um, design systems. And the guy who built it is actually the lead programmer um, and inventor of the flat red ball game engine, which I have been uh, a contributor to for about a decade now. And he's one of my best friends. So most of these games we've worked on together at some level. Town Razor was interesting. We're going to come back to this because a sort of hacky um, art system that I invented for this game in the interest of time is, is a foundational thing that I, I'm using in my current game. Um, Town Razor was interesting because we wanted to do kind of a remake of an old Nintendo game called Act Razor. And we wanted to do it in a single month. And we had a team of either four or five people. And um, so making a game with five people in a month requires very good communication and very tight uh, scope. And so I think I'm proud of this game because how we got so many people to come together and build something that is actually really fun. It looks good. It's it's just kind of a neat little tiny game. Um, and the efficiency on this is like, I don't know if, we, if we've matched it on a project since. Uh, Battle Crypt Bombers is a game that uh, I made just with my friend Vic, who is the flat red, um, flat red Ball engine creator. And this game um, was the first game where I felt really proud of my pixel art. And it was also a game where my kids wanted to play it constantly. And so I knew when we were creating this game that we were building something that was exciting and fun to play uh, because my kids were literally bugging me constantly to play it together. Um, and this game we also built in a single month. That's an exercise that we went through. Several of the games on here are games that we built start to finish in a single month. And that exercise has been really valuable to um, my career and my whole approach to game development. Ship Squabble was another one month game. Not going to talk too much about this, but it was the first game that we made split screen, which had a lot of challenges. Um, and the idea behind this was to take the combat mechanics that we liked from um, Sea of Thieves, which has a very kind of slow paced, but intense at the same time, uh, naval combat. And uh, we wanted to just take that one little element and capture that in a simpler form, which is also a really good exercise for the game designer brain. Masteroid was the first game that I built basically completely by myself and released on Steam. So that's out on Steam now. It's a um, very casual, atmospheric, relaxing space trading and combat game. And then Cosmo Squad is a game that we built, um, again, my friend Vic and I, in three months last year and released on Steam. So that game was interesting because we, we wanted to take the one-month game concept and push it a little further into a full polished Steam release. And um, while this game has not had... Uh, near the player base of a lot of the games. Like it kind of just flew under the radar because we released it just before the big marketing push of, of Q4. Uh, I think it's one of the best games I've built. It's um, Vic did most of the design. I did all of the art and contributed to some of the concepts and systems, but it's just a very tight and polished game. So those are a few of the things that I've worked on. If we have questions about these or want to see them, most of these are linked off. Uh, so I can share the, the deck as well, um, or we can come back to them if uh, you all have questions later. So um, the meat of what I want to talk about is this kind of mission and concept that I have that really re revolves around asking yourself um, two questions. The ultimate mission, and sorry, I'm just uh, pulling up the chat here as well, because I saw that there was a, a message in chat. Um, so I'll keep an eye on that as well if people want to ask questions by chat. Um, so my real mission is to ship bigger games faster. And every word in that uh, kind of has a special meaning to me. Like ship means you have to finish it. That's an important part of the exercise is, you know, I have a thousand started and abandoned projects, but the exercise of taking something all the way to the end and shipping it in some form, whether that's just posting it on itch uh, or a personal website or Steam, um, that exercise of shipping and forcing yourself to to go the final stretch, like the last 
you know, five yards or meters um, are the hardest. And so making yourself get there is a really healthy exercise. Um, bigger means pushing yourself a little harder every time. So um, the biggest problem I feel like indies have is going too big. So understanding exactly how much more you can bite off than you did last time and still make it, um, that's a that's a big deal to me. And so I'm always trying to push the, the game I'm working on now a little further than I did the last one. Um, games, I underline, like that seems like obvious, right? We all know what a game is, but uh, a game to me is something that inspires like joy and wonder. I'm not interested in making games that are punishing and miserable or horrific. Like I want to make games where you look at them and you're like, that's, that's cute. I want to live in that little world. It's, it's charming. And, um, and I, I like to build games where they make you, they make the gamer feel good about themselves and, and are fun. Um, and it's like, that seems obvious, but I play games every day that are not like that. <laughs> So it's just something I like to kind of keep in mind as my design philosophy. And then faster is just about productivity and efficiency, investing in your tool chain, investing in the skills that you don't have yet, um, taking the time to build a system that will make you faster the next time. Um, if you've solved the problem, you know, two times in a row, well, then you're probably going to solve it again in the, in the future. So is there a way that you can solve it faster? So um, I mentioned there's two questions that I like to ask myself, um, and we're going to do a, a concrete exercise with this. The first one is, what can I build? And you'll notice that most of the things that I've worked on are two-dimensional games with kind of a retro pixely style. Uh, the Masteroid space game that I mentioned on one of the early slides is probably one of the only exceptions to that. Um, I'm not a 3D modeler, and every person that I add to a project increases the probability of failure because it adds communication overhead. Um, and so I really think about, you know, what are the, what are the, my own and my team's capabilities and what can we effectively build? I can't build a massively multiplayer battle royale game. I just can't do it. I don't have some of the critical skills. I don't know some of the key tooling that I need. I don't, I, I'm not a 3D modeler. And so it really makes sense to stop and think about what kind of a project or what kind of a game is really going to fit into your um, your core skill set and, and your sort of best traits. The next thing I think about is what is the smallest way that I can build it? And this is a really hard um, thing to apply concretely. And I also think it's one of the biggest challenges in software development in general and game development and maybe all of life. Like the first thing that happens in a project, as soon as you say an idea, the next sentence that anybody says will add scope to that idea. They will make it bigger. That always happens in every single project. It's like, let's build a calculator. And then somebody says, what if it could also do this? And um, that, that is a killer of indie games. And so scoping is one of the most key skills that you can build as a designer, as a game developer, as an artist in any role, and even in um, any kind of software development, understanding how to scope a project and constrain it and tailor it to what you can actually do is super important. So those questions are very much like they have a lot of overlap. They're very related, but they're sort of uh, two different sides of the same coin, I guess. So let's do um, an exercise. This is literally how I came to my current um, game. So when I was younger, I really enjoyed action RPGs. I played a lot of Diablo. I've played a lot of Diablo 3. I've played Path of Exile and Torchlight and Minecraft Dungeons and pretty much uh, most of the ARPGs that get popular. Excuse me, I play at some point. And I've always wanted to build one. I think it would be so fun to make a tiny um, Diablo. But that first question is, uh, what can I build? And so I sat down a while ago just thinking, like, I, I really, I was done with a project. I was like, I really want to build an action RPG. I've never done it. I want to make a game that has, you know, fast-paced, active combat, has 
some loot aspects, has some maybe dungeons or randomization, maybe some procedurally generated content. And I was excited about these ideas, but it was like, can I actually do it? Well, where do I start? And so I started with um, thinking about calculating the art load. And so assuming this is a two-dimensional game, that's my forte, that's my strength, um, and it has four movement directions. So that's the first constraint that I'm imposing. You can move up, down, left, and right. It's a top-down game. You're going to need a resting animation. So you're going to need the character, a, a frame where they breathe in, a frame where they breathe out. That's the usual kind of resting is when the character's not moving. They have like a little breathing or blinking or some kind of animation. Uh, so you're going to need two frames for that, three directions. You have to do up and down. Left and right, you, you only have to do one of those and then you can flip it. Um, and so that's six frames. And so the same thing for each thing. Walking, need four frames. Attacking, four frames. That's probably kind of a minimum. Dashing, if you do a, a roll, it'd be more than two frames. If you do some kind of like blur effect, maybe you could do it in two frames. These are just guesstimates. Um, every one of those needs to be in three directions. So per character, we're looking at 36 animation frames that need to be done. Well, I wanted to make it local co-op. So four players, local co-op, not going to do any kind of networking. That adds an enormous amount of scope. So let's keep it couch co-op. I could play it on the couch with my kids or my friends. Um, four players. We're at 144 animation frames because I need four unique characters times 36 uh, frames per character. Then um, 10 enemies. So enemies are going to be similar to the player. They're going to need similar um, uh, animation frames for each direction. So we got 10 enemies, that's 360 animation frames, five weapons. Well, weapons have to have a resting, walking, attacking, dashing animation as well. Like that that sword or whatever's in their hand has got to be doing something while the character's doing all of those animations. You can separate those out and then layer the sprites, but you still have to do a similar level of animation so you can overlay it. So 180 frames for weapons. And then same thing for armor, another 180 frames. Same thing applies. It's got to overlay the character sprites. you got to be able to put different armor on them. Um, and so we're looking at 864 frames. That is just character art. So we're not talking about doing any background art, no programming. Um, we're at 868 or 864 frames. So let's say I can do 10 per day. Now, you might think you should be able to do more than 10 animation frames in a day, but you have to do character design you have to come up with your color palette so there's some there's more work than just the production of a single frame of animation and if you're talking about you know 10 enemies you're probably gonna have to do some concept art and so without getting too complicated i just sort of baked that in and said yeah i could probably do 10 a day and again this is just a rough scoping exercise i want to get a, a a sort of intuition for the size of this without having to do a bunch of um you know, boring and nitpicky math. So let's say I can do 10 a day. That's 86 days of um, frame animation. That's 17 weeks at working five days a week. Um, and that's about four months. I can't do this. Like that is out of my, I, I will definitely burn out doing animation for four months straight. Um, I'm I'm the kind of person who does all of or as much as I can on the game myself. And even if I was just the artist, just grinding through animations is very time consuming. Uh, and I see that Anne said make the uh, character symmetrical. So that is actually baked in, but you can't flip them up and down. So you still have to animate the up and down direction. And then you can just do right and flip it. So you have three directions instead of four. So that actually doesn't um, decrease the frame count by much. And there there could be some other optimi optimizations in here, but you're going to be taking, you know, a few numbers off of this um, and it's still uh, it's still a, a big workload. So I kind of just had this in the back of my brain. I was like kind of disappointed. I'm like, I really want to build an ARPG. And I, I was talking to my friend Vic about this. And I was like, I just don't have it in me to do this much art. I, I know I'll burn out on the art and I won't get the development done. The other thing that happens is um, you do this art, you do enough to get the game working, and then as you start building,
building the game, you need to redo art. So you end up overlapping on this work. Like your first shot at a attacking animation probably isn't going to be perfect. Your first shot at weapons design might be not what game design dictates that is fun later in the game. You don't know what's going to be fun up front. And so you you end up doing work that is thrown away. It's inevitable. You can't fully escape it. Um, and so really, this is probably understated in a lot of ways. So then I was remembering um, that game that I mentioned, Town Razor. And when we were building Town Razor, uh, again, we built that with a team of, I think it was four people in um, four weeks. And I didn't do any programming in that game. All I did was art. I actually came into that game a little bit late and they had already started the game with placeholder art that they just got off of some website of free art. But the placeholder art didn't have any kind of consistent sense of style and it was not the same color palette and not the same scales, like things were out of scale with each other. And so I was like, you guys are doing awesome work on this, but the art is not good. <laughs> like it would like hurt me to see the the game that they were building that was cool, but the art just was not working together. And so I came in and just reskinned the game basically. Um, and one of the things that we they had was these little uh, sort of peasant characters, like in the old school War, Warcraft game, that would um, mine trees and and mine gold and bring that back to the little village. And so I remember I like did the little character art and I was thinking about like animating them and I'm like, oh, then we got to map the animation frames and we got to write the code to implement the animations and play the like chopping animations and the walking animations and all of that stuff. And our team doesn't have time for that. So I just wrote instructions in a, a task to one of the programmers, like imagine a little kid playing with an action figure and how they kind of just bounce it along the floor and, and wiggle it side to side and just do that with one sprite. And he did that. Oh, and I said, put a shadow under it. So it looks like, like you can tell the sense of depth because in a 2D top down game, it could be hard to tell where the character is uh, in the world depth wise without some kind of shadow to, to ground them. And so I said, just bounce them on their shadow and that'll have to be good enough given our time constraints. And he did exactly that. And it looked amazing. Like it, it actually added to the game. It made it like it gave these characters like this cute little kind of whimsical feel. And so I was thinking about that randomly. And I had this idea. What if I just take that same concept, but I, I go a little deeper and I do three sprites, a head sprite, a body sprite and a leg sprite with a shadow underneath. So technically four, but these are the, the unique ones. And then one weapon sprite. And then I just sort of wiggle them. And so this is like, I don't know, it could be two characters fighting or one character in two different frames of walking. I don't remember what I was thinking when I sketched this, but I just sketched this out on a piece of paper. Um, I don't even think I was at the computer. And I just wrote wiggle sprites. And um, the idea was, what if there's no animation at all? What if there's no frame animation? Then that reduces your workload like astronomically. And so here's the, the recalculation of that. So if a character's three sprites and the weapon's one sprite, and I'm not counting the shadow sprite because it's like three seconds to do. Um, and then armor, there would be one piece of armor for each one of those head, body, and legs. So also three sprites, sprites of armor. Well, now four players is only 12 uh, sprites. And if I do 10 enemies like that, well, they're just the three sprite frames. Um, and this is... Uh, 30 sprites and five weapons. Well, they're only one sprite a piece. So now five weapons is only five sprites and five armors is only 15 sprites. So now my whole total is 62. That's a week of work, maybe a, a little bit more, but like I went from months of work to one week just by imposing um, some constraints and figuring out how, what's the smallest, the absolutely smallest way that I could build this. And in one week, I had a proof of concept, and hopefully the screen share animation is clean enough that you can see what's going on. Yep, yep. But yeah, so this was this was my animation. Um, I did the three little sprites. You can see I have a resting animation, I have a walking animation, and I've got attack animations. The attack animation is just rotating the sprites. Like I, I didn't. There's no frame animation happening here. Um, and I love this. I was like, oh, this is so cute. Like, I, I already want to play this game because I love this kind of like old school um, 
like old school look, but with higher uh, color palettes and you know deeper game design and and more polish and particle effects and things that they couldn't put in old games. Um, and so this really validated that this was possible. And this is how my current game, which is called We RPG, is uh, born. And somebody in chat just said, reminds me a bit of Forager style. I was super inspired by Forager, actually. I totally forgot about that until you said that. I played Forager. I think it was free on Game Pass. And I played that game, and I was like, this uh, developer just nailed this idea of doing the kind of minimum. That game does have a lot of frame animation. Um, but uh, I definitely remember being inspired um, by Forager. So um, We RPG is the name of the game that I'm working on. It totally was born of this idea of um, shipping the smallest systems possible. And I wanted to just quickly hit a point that I um, jotted down to make sure I remembered to say uh, and then forgot to say. <laughs> um, but I want to be clear that I approach game dev as a hobby. I have never, I've made money from games, um, sometimes a fair amount of money from games, but it's never been my living wage. And I'm always wary of game dev advice, especially on you know forums like Reddit and things like that. There's a lot of people with strong opinions, but it's like, have you actually shipped games uh, that you know <laughs> people have played? And I think that is a good question to ask because there is a lot of bad advice out there. And, um, you know, to, to kind of ask that question myself, well, I've shipped plenty of games. I don't have any games that are really big hits. But one thing I just wanted to say is this, um, this concept of tight scoping and imposing constraints on yourself and shipping smaller, like this has been hugely valuable to me in my non-game dev career. So. Um, as I, my bio mentioned, I work for Microsoft. I work on um, a really big product called Visual Studio. And um, at Microsoft and at all of my previous jobs, being able to impose and constrain scope, like impose uh, tight restrictions and manage scope has been just extremely valuable to shipping all types of products. And I, I believe it's really valuable in game dev as well. So um, I just wanted to call uh that out as well um and so that's kind of the slide so really everything now is about um live demos so of, of data-driven gameplay so the other thing about this is i've really focused on um making my gameplay data-driven and so um i thought i would go ahead and just show you all the current state of the game um, so we're going to do a live build here, and uh, hopefully nothing breaks. It's always a little bit scary to do uh, totally live builds. Um, but I want to show a little bit. This is going to take just a little bit of time to show you enough of uh, the game to kind of understand the systems behind it, but I think it'll really give context to the systems. And then um, everything after this, I'll show you the systems, and you all can fire questions at me, um, ask how things work, and... I have my whole tool chain up here so I can show you all um, everything uh, that I've built. Uh, this is a title screen. I'm gonna kind of gloss over this and not talk too much about um, any of this. So this is your home base. You can go here and change your inventory. Um, so you can equip different uh, types of stuff. You can tell these like frames are just stacked on each other. So extremely low budget way to build stuff. There's a dash mechanic, so that's the the dash. This armor enhances your dash a lot. Uh, you can talk to merchants, buy and sell your gear. Um, you can upgrade your mana and health. Right now, mana doesn't actually do anything. Yeah, this is a little luchador. That's how you update your health. Um, when I said I like to build things that are like cute and whimsical, like I love stuff like that. Like, why is there a luchador and like a sort of fantasy setting game. I really uh, want to um, at some point release a like cyberpunk DLC or something for this game. I think it'd be really fun to to try to take on a, a totally different like style of uh, design and stuff for this. Um, so the idea of the game is there's um, there's dungeons. Every time you pass one, you get uh, a deeper difficulty. 
you get gear and loot in the dungeons. We're going to start on level 20 because I've uh, kind of artificially leveled this character. You can see I have $9 million. That's not normal. That's because this is a test character. So this is kind of the game. These little guys spawn every level. They get harder. There's a, a bunch of randomized levels. And um, as you uh, as you like pass levels, your character, you can level up your, your uh, character stats as well. You get better weapons, you get better gear, um, and then it's kind of uh, repeat. So that's the kind of gameplay loop. Right now, I don't have any story um, or any, any elements like that. There's treasure scattered throughout. Um, this has four-player local co-op, and then at some point, you find an exit, and you can choose to go another level deeper um, or go home. And uh, also, this is like... I've been working on this since November, um, and it's, what is this month, February? So this is a lot of progress in a pretty short time. Um, there's a lot of systems in this game, and I think it's the way that I've gone about this, making it very data-driven, has is the only way I've been able to build a game this big um, so quickly. But there's a lot of untuned stuff in this. I saw somebody uh, mention Dash looks really aggressive. Um, yeah, this is higher level armor. I've barely tested. I literally uh, put a lot of this into the game about a week ago. Um, so I've barely play tested uh, the kind of automatic progression of difficulty and armor and stuff. So yeah, I'm sure the damage amounts and a lot of that stuff are, are really poorly tuned. Um, yeah, and so you basically go, <clears throat> excuse me, as long as you can. You get gold payout for every enemy that you destroyed, and that scales up with uh, level. And then you um, can uh, update your inventory, or I mean, uh, change out your equipment. You can um, pay the vendors to upgrade your stats and do it again. And that's pretty much the loop. There's a major system that is not implemented, and that is this game is classless. So you don't pick your class. You just create a little character, and your gear determines your class. And the gear will eventually um, give you uh, special abilities, like your magic, basically. The magic systems will come from the gear that you have equipped. So like in a lot of uh, RPGs, the you know sort of cloth armors and the weaker armors will give you more spell power types of abil abilities. And the metal and leather armors will give you more you know ranged or melee <clears throat> types of abilities. So uh, abilities will be all gear based. That's the last major system I need to implement in the game. And then I've implemented almost no sound. So those are the two kind of major things. And the rest is all um, content creation. Uh, so that's the game. Um, I wanted to demonstrate enough of it that you could kind of see how it works and then show you the magic behind it. Um, and at this point, like, feel free to, to jump in. I'm used to using Teams, so if you use the raise the hand, uh, raise your hand icon too, um, I should be able to see that. So um, I'll just keep talking, uh, but definitely jump in. And, and I'm trying to read the chat. If it scrolls too fast, I can't uh, talk and read it at the same time, but uh, I'm trying. So the core idea about progression, progression I think is one of the hardest things in designing an ARPG or any type of game where uh, the enemies um, the enemies get harder and your abilities get better. Uh, that's like you burn a lot of time there in playtesting and thinking about how that progression should work. What I did, and I see Jordy's question, I'll answer that in just a second. I had this idea of a central multiplier in the game. So one number that the whole game um, revolves around and scales so the weapon damage scales up the health scales up the um, gold payout all scale up this multiplier is at the heart of the game and so the first thing i did was come up with the algorithm to generate the multiplier multiplier and for that i just researched common like classic games like i think i looked at games like runescape and other games that had published their progression algorithm and i came up with my own that was kind of similar i graphed that so I can kind of see what that curve looks like. So you want to progress, you know, small amounts early. Like you want your, you don't want your weapon to go from one damage to five damage. That would be uh, a huge jump. You know, we go from like one to 1.2 to 1.5, but then up 
in here somewhere it starts going a little bit more exponential and now you're jumping by you know factors of five or ten um and then these the rest of these columns are just showing me what different multiples of this multiplier add up to so if i give a, a weapon a base damage of two versus one how does that scale if if uh, armor has five resistance how does that scale so i can just kind of quickly look at this chart as a lookup and say okay at level 25 if a um, piece of armor has five resistance it's going to have 176 total resistance and oh, excuse me i got wet my throat here real quick so um the first thing in this kind of this is why i was waiting a little bit to answer jordy's question it's good to be able to paper mock um, you asked about play testing. Well, before you play test, because you can burn an enormous amount of time in play testing and just like micro tuning and optimizing. But with this, I can kind of see like I know if you have a sword um, at level, you know, that does two damage at level 37 and armor that absorbs one damage uh, or sorry, at level 18, the sword's going to do 37 damage. The armor's going to absorb 18 of it. Um, and so and I can also say, well, if the creature also has a base health of one, he has 18 total damage. So one hit is going to kill a character with 18 resistance and 18 life. Um, it'll just barely kill them in one hit. And so if I don't want somebody to be one hit, then I know that I need to increase the base level of health or armor resistance. So first concept is the entire game scales around a single number. I can turn this one knob and it controls how fast or slow the game progresses. So there's one big tuning knob. And I think of everything um, in terms of game design as number of knobs you can turn. The more knobs you can turn, the more you can fine tune your game and the more powerful uh, decisions you can make with game design, but also the more overwhelmingly complex it can get. And when you start turning too many knobs, it's really easy to just screw up and realize you're actually moving the wrong direction and getting less fun instead of more fun. Um, Emilius, I hope I'm not mispronouncing names here. Uh, please forgive me if I do. Is cross-classing a thing? Yes, you can kind of do that. Um, there, there is no concept of being counted as a knight. If you want to have be kind of good at ranged and kind of good at melee and kind of good at casting spells, you could wear a wizard hat and uh, a leather vest and metal pants and carry uh, a sword or whatever you want. There's also no limits on inventory. So um, you can keep different loadouts. Like if you're solo playing and you like being a, a tanky kind of player, you could have all of your metal armor and broadsword for solo playing. But then if I get on with my kids and I like to be a, a dashy little like rogue and um, shooting arrows, I could have my you know leather armor and crossbow loadout. Um, there's something else I was going to mention with that. I can't remember what it was. Uh, and yes, there will be bosses. I will probably have every um, like fifth or tenth level be a boss. And I have not implemented that. That's a I sort of have tiers of priorities. So the first priority is to be systems complete. Um, and systems complete means all the major game systems are in. They may not be tuned and tested, but they're in and, and I have knobs to turn. Um, and so I still have abilities to implement to be systems complete, and then I'll start thinking about bosses. But the game needs to be fun with combat first, then it needs to be fun with abilities, and then it needs to be fun with bosses. So at each level, I want to um, I want the game to be fun. So real quick before I uh, answer any more, um, I just want to show how armor. So there's a tab here, and oh, I'm using Google Sheets. Um, Excel is a tool that a lot of people use as well. I'm using Google Sheets because it's really easy to script my own add-ons in um, JavaScript. And so I have a method that converts a sheet to JSON, which is what my game consumes to read it in. So I can just select this. Uh, I found out the hard way that Google Sheets has a 50,000 character limit for any one cell. So I did have a function that just takes everything in a sheet and, and spits it out as JSON, that quickly overflowed that limit. And so I had to actually write a little extension. So if I wanna um, select all of my 
armors. And I think this is all of them. I added this game design convert to JSON. It dumps this out. I can download it or copy and paste it. In my game, I have armor.json. I paste it in here, and this is what my game consumes for all of the armor. Um, Armor has, uh, you know, ID names, set names. Uh, I'm not actually using set names right now, but I put them into the game just because I feel like it's something I'm probably gonna uh, need. The chain name is the actual animation chain um, that that maps the sprite. Um, then there's uh, the item type, so head, uh, body, or leg armor. There's qualities. Um, there's uh, magic types. I haven't implemented magic because that'll be related to the abilities, but I know the names of those. Um, and with Google Sheets, you can define uh, things like enums, and you can say constrain the input to this list. So that's actually what I'm doing. I have a drop down here that is constrained to a list. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm skimming a chat at the same time. Um, I think, uh, is it Zahn, hopefully, X A N? Um, I think I'm hopefully kind of answering your question right now about planning. Uh, I start small. I think what is what attributes do I need to have for armor and what's the minimum set of attributes? So these are the, the minimum set of attributes for armor. They need to have a min and max level. This determines wh what levels they'll drop at. So this particular piece of armor, which is a, oh, this is a placeholder, so it will never drop. But um, let's pick one like this is a tattered bone. And this is these are not final names. This is I'm just concatenating uh, some fields to give it some name right now. I'll go in and give these like unique names and descriptions. Um, but uh, this is bone armor. Tattered is a quality tier. So my quality tiers are tattered, worn, sturdy, fine, gilded, and epic. Um, and then the armor has a material. So there's wood, cloth, bone, leather, and metal. Um, and so a tattered bone head armor will drop from levels three to eight. It has a base value of 91, so it will be leveled based on where it drops. So if it drops on level five, it'll be a uh, base value of 91. So if we look at our progression, call it 100. And at level five, that will cost 150 gold. Um, so that's kind of how those lookups work and how I kind of paper mock. Um, the base resistance is one, so it will resist one damage at level one. That scales. Uh, the max damage resistance, this prevents you from being able to have a set of armor that can resist infinite damage or more damage than you're taking. So this piece of armor will never resist more than 6.25% of the total damage uh, that the player takes. So if you if this number ends up being 1,000 and you get hit by somebody that deals 500 damage, it'll never take more than 6.25% because this armor should never get too good. Um, knockback resistance, when you take <clears throat> damage, sorry, my throat is going super dry. When you take damage, um, you uh, this is how much the armor resists movement. So for a lightweight armor, this number is gonna be really low. For heavy metal armor, this number is gonna be higher. The dash velocity um, is also, this is how I basically give the armor a feeling of weight. So like uh, somebody noticed that you could dash way too far. Well, that's probably just because my leather armor's weight isn't quite high enough. It has too much dash velocity. So here's the problem with this. If we look at this sheet and we zoom out so we can see all of these numbers, let's say I'm playing my game, and this kind of ties into the playtesting uh, question again. I'm playing my game, and I realize leather armor allows you to move too fast. I can dash too fast in leather armor. Well, look how many numbers I have to change here. All of these armors are leather, so, and I don't even have all the armor into the game yet. There's 76 pieces of armor. And remember, my original estimate was for 10. In four months, I have a game that has 76 pieces of armor, uh, right now, 19 creatures uh, over our original estimate of 10. I think actually it might have been five armors. Um, and I have 122 weapons in the game right now. Um, but anyway, so to go back to this, so leather armor, it's too fast. I got to come in here 
and I got to adjust all of these dash velocities. And I have to adjust these dash velocities like I need to keep them relative to each other. So like, you know, this tattered leather, like the junk armor can't be too competitive with the like gilded leather, epic leather, great armor. And so how do you do that? Like there's all these numbers to tune. And if one piece of armor or a class of armor is a little bit off, like head armor all resists a little bit too much damage. How do I modify all of these without one of them getting like a simple input error could could make a really hard to detect bug. There's no way I can play test enough to test every iteration of every piece of armor. So if I type one number in here wrong, I could have a really bad bug that um, ships with the game. And in a past game, I built uh, my space game Masteroid the same way. Ships had uh, a big sheet of properties and I ran into that problem. So this is a problem that I know is a real problem because I've ran into it. I need to change all of the scout ships to move a little bit slower or a little bit faster. Um, going through this and and changing them without anything like without screwing anything up, it was terrible. I had to create these like index columns where I sort of measured the sanity of um, the ship or the whatever the weapon I was doing, and like it was a nightmare. So with this, I started down this path of just having a sheet where I punched in numbers, but then I started thinking about, well, wait a minute, what actually makes up this dash velocity number? Well, the type of armor or the, the slot that it fits in affects it. Like the pants you're wearing might have a bigger impact on dash velocity than a helmet. The material affects it. So if it's leather, maybe it uh, you can dash better in it than um, if it's like solid plate iron. Um, excuse me. And so I realized that each of these numbers was actually um, co uh, composed of multiple other factors. And so I started thinking about, can I break that out? Can I simplify this to where there's actually fewer knobs to turn, but they still give me the same level of power? Because this is a lot of freaking knobs to turn. Like, it's a lot. Um, and I will definitely make a lot of mistakes. So I started breaking things out by type. I started with an armor material and I set base values and max resistance percents and knockback percents and dash velocities. And it was much easier to distill this and just think about this at this level. I don't want any metal leather to drop before level seven, but they can drop all the way to right now. The soft max is actually 50. I just put 99 in here. My dash velocities mostly scale up. Um, so. No armor, your base dash velocity without armor is 300. Um, wood is 350. Cloth is a little faster than wood. Le uh, bone is just a little slower, but it has um, a higher base resistance than uh, cloth. Leather, metal actually has higher dash than bone because uh, it's there's like less friction. Um, and it also has higher resistance, so good leather armor is just better than, uh, than bone. And then um, metal. And when I uh, start adding um, mana consumption for abilities in here, these will all have a um, some impact on that as well. So I've broken out a much easier to read progression here uh, by armor type. And then I came up with the idea of modifiers. So for armor, you have base attributes that are defined by the type of armor, so wood, cloth, bone, leather, or metal, but then you have modifiers. So the item quality modifies the, the value of that, and it also modifies the min and max level. So tattered armor um, will drop at lower levels, uh, and it modifies the quality down to half of its base. At sturdy, you're at 1x the base. So sturdy is the sort of the number I see in armor materials. This is for sturdy armor. When you get in the fine and gilded, fine gilded and epic, they actually improve over the base. And so the gap between tattered armor and epic armor, and this is totally untuned. These are base numbers I punched in to start testing. Um, this uh, basically, the idea is you have a, a base and then modifiers.
Um, and so I'm just kind of catching up. Um, uh, it's approach inspired by Pax. I, I'm not, I've played Path of Exile. I'm not familiar with their mass table um, approach though. So uh, that didn't inspire this, um, but I'm sure that others have come up with this idea. Um, this was mostly driven for me by problems I've run into in, in past games. Um, and then, so we weapons the, were... when we when we built ba base busters, which was a mobile uh, game, we had lots and lots of cards and tanks and whatnot. We had a very similar problem. And and what I think is really cool about this solution is that in the end, the thing is converted down to JSON, and and the the engine will eat it up, right? And it means that all the basic calculations are all done in sheets outside of that engine. So that if you have designers with low uh, scripting knowledge, I mean, in your case, you don't have that issue. But uh, with us in the studio, we had the problem that we didn't want to have programmers constantly on the whims of the designers needed to re-implement other mechanics. You can just do it in sheets, in the end, bake it down to a JSON, and, and, and it's uh, back into the game. Yes, and actually that has another advantage as well. Um, in Masteroid, I had this idea that the game would ship with uh, JSON-defined its properties. But I actually hosted the JSON files on a server as well. And when the game started yeah. up, it hit the server and it said, do you have a fresher version of this? And so the idea was I could actually tune and improve game design without um, deploying an update to the game just by changing the JSON file on the server. And the game would do some sanity yeah. checks and it would say, you know, does this actually compile? Is it like broken? And um, if it worked, then it would replace its local cached copy with the new design. I ended up ripping that out because um, I just never used it. Like it was easy to deploy a new game update in, in Steam and it was actually really hard to maintain the server copy and build all the versioning version checking. So that was premature optimization for me and I tore it out. But I built this spreadsheet JSON concept originally to be able to ship balance updates without shipping the game. And then it just became the like de facto way that I design uh, games and armor creatures maps. They all work the same thing, uh, the same way. Creatures actually aren't broken out. They're just flat numbers because they don't really have um, as many components to them. Um, and there are biome specific creatures and biome specific weapons. So you can see that like these type of creatures only um, uh, spawn in certain biomes. And right now, Armors and weapons, I have biome set to any for everything, but eventually, you know, bone will probably only drop in the dungeons, wood will only drop in the forest, and I'm actually probably going to build a um, set of stone armor that drops in castles as the base types of armor. And then there'll be top end. On the top end, the biome will determine the magic type. So there might be, you know, epic metal armor, but um, there's three magic types, there's three biomes. Each biome will have, uh, you could get, metal armor that drops with different uh, magic abilities based on the biome where it dropped. And so again, small number of knobs, large number of, a uh, large amount of flexibility is the key. And here's all those modifiers being pulled in. And then this is kind of nasty, but if you look at um, like uh, the min level is the max of the item qualities min level and the armor materials min level. So if armor material says this this can't drop till level level seven, but item quality says this can drop at level three. It won't drop until level seven. It takes the max of that as the minimum level, um, and the max level does the inverse. It takes the minimum. Um, the base values. It's doing a, a lookup of the armor material value, multiplying it by the total uh, value of all of the modifiers, and then flooring that to get a round number. Um, and that's how everything works. And then this number is scaled by the level where it drops. So there's 76 pieces of armor. They can drop at level one, theoretically through 50. Not everyone can drop at every level, but they will also be uh, scaled by where they dropped. So um, every one of these pieces of armor, you might be excited to get multiple times because it might be better than the last set that you got. And you can also visit, I didn't show this when I was demoing the game, but you can visit a blacksmith and pay an amount of money to level up your armor to the next level. Since everything revolves around the central progression calculation, I can say, oh, okay, we can just push this armor piece up and it just changes the multiplier and that's applied across the board to stuff. Um, so that's kind of how everything works. 
Uh, design wise, there's uh, I build levels in tiled. So I talked about building um, levels in uh, with graph paper when I was a little kid. Well, um, still doing the same thing. Like take all this away, you have graph paper, and there's just layers of uh, art here. Um, but I'm I'm still designing levels in graph paper. That's the home level that you saw. Here's the forest. These are still kind of test levels. These levels are designed more to test the art that I've created than to be actually enjoyable levels. Um, but there's uh, these little placeholders are the enemy spawners. They spawn into rooms. Uh, the enemies won't leave this room, so they won't chase you out of, of this area. Um, there will be places that are harder to get to, um, like you have to fight more armor but or uh, more enemies, but you get um, loot chests. Oh, one other decision I made. So I've played Minecraft Dungeons, Diablo, and a little bit of Path of Exile with my kids. And one thing for us playing couch co-op that really killed the momentum um, was every time somebody opened a chest, they wanted to go look at all of their inventory. And I really hated that because we'd be in the middle of a run. Minecraft Dungeons was the worst of offender. And then everybody like gets something and, they, and you got to pause the game and everybody sits in the middle of the run like it really kills the momentum and so in my game i said okay you can only manage your inventory at the inventory chest at your home base in your bedroom then we do a run we get through a dungeon everybody's got some gear they're excited to check it out you guys check out your inventory i'm going to take a bathroom break or i'm going to get some food so this whole thing is built around uh the kind of couch co-op experience that i love to have with friends and we've used um steam remote play in cosmo squad uh, and it worked like shockingly well. So we didn't have to implement multiplayer, networked multiplayer, and we got networked multiplayer through Steam Remote Play. And I'm pretty confident that's going to work really well for this game too. Um, so you'll be able to play networked multiplayer um, thanks to Steam, and I don't have to write any code. There's a tiny bit of latency, but it's uh, it's manageable. Um, so again, um, you know, Trying to find the easy way out as many ways as possible. Here's uh, the dungeon level, which um, you guys didn't see. I've, I'm just working on the castle biome right now. This is not playable yet, um, but I've been working on all the art for this. Um, again, you know, I'm going for like whimsical and cute, not dark and gothic. Uh, and so that's kind of the whole flavor of this game. Um, I want it to be something that anybody can play uh, all ages. Um, yeah, I will be releasing this on Steam. I don't know when. Uh, I'll probably do some kind of beta testing program when it's a little bit further along. And I have contemplated finding a publisher because we built Cosmo Squad and self-published on Steam. And that game, honestly, objectively, is pretty amazing. It's really fun. Our friends who have played it have been super hooked. Um, and we knew it was good because we kept play testing when we were supposed to be developing. Like, we'd end up just playing. And um, But the game, like, did garbage in sales i mean i think it's sold like maybe 60 copies in three months just terrible it barely paid its uh steam yeah. application submission fee which i have the luxury of this being mostly a hobby so i don't really care but it's kind of sad i'm like we built this thing it's really fun i wish more people could enjoy it and so because of that i'm um probably going to pitch this game to some publishers and see if i can get some uh wider exposure yeah, some marketing traction as well yeah, and I actually realized I'm over time. I still have time. I, I should have known I would be, it would take me longer to get through all this, but I still have time if people still want to, um, if we still have time and if people want to ask more questions. Yeah, I think if, if people have another lecture or anything else to go to, then they'll, uh, they'll pop out. And otherwise, we can just kind of uh, stay here until we're done. Okay. Uh, do I do marketing at all? Jordy asked. Um, I. So the reason Renee found me is because I drop GIFs and art on Twitter. That is about the extent of the marketing I, do, I can do. This takes so much time, you know, to, to do all of this work. Like I do the design. I wrote all the code. I, I did all the art. Um, I have like no energy left for marketing. And that's why the games flop. Like the people who play them, all the games we've built have good reviews, positive player feedback. I have, um, analytics implemented in the game so i can see you know how long play sessions are where players get stuck i can tell that people enjoy the games that we build nobody plays them because there's so much noise it's really hard to um 
get out of the noise. Uh, if we had more players, you know, I'm sure we'd get some negative reviews and have things to fix, but like, that's an easy problem to have. Um, our biggest problem is just getting above the noise. So, and yeah, and marketing, it just takes a lot of energy. Um, and the other thing that I was just going to show if we had time is this is my, I do all my art on a sprite sheet. So here's like uh, game entities. Here's all the tiled work so far. Um, as I mentioned, creatures are just three sprites. And then I do a put together version so I can kind of preview them. That's awesome. This is biome specific armor and weapons that I am working on. These aren't implemented yet. Um, there's 120 weapons right here. So there's three quality tiers of wood, four quality tiers of bone, three quality tiers of bronze, four quality tiers of uh, iron, six quality tiers of steel. This is the full quality tier. So only steel has uh, an implementation in every quality. Same thing with armors. There's wood, bone, uh, leather, cloth, and metal. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, how do you determine what it is you can build? For instance, if you lack insight into programming and art and are starting from zero, build games. Build as many games as you as you can and build the smallest games that you can. Like come up with the smallest idea like, you know, Flappy Bird or we've had a person in the game engine chat that wanted to build the uh, uh, Super Mario Brothers level. We're like build level one of Super Mario Brothers, understand how hard it is and where like what you fall down on do you struggle with programming the physics and code um, and then are there ways to get around that is there an engine that is built for platformers and that's what you want to build um, do you suck at art well maybe you got to find like make good friends with uh like somebody who's skilled at art you know if you don't if you don't have money to pay people to do work then you need to make friends with people who are as passionate and have different skill sets as you. And I've definitely done that a lot. I've got a friend who worked, it was a sound designer on Warframe um, and he's done sound design for me. My best friend is the programmer of the flat red ball uh, game engine. So when there's stuff where I'm like, Hey man, this sucks. Uh, like a week later, he's got features implemented into the core engine that fix my problems. So it's like an amazing luxury to have, but it just came from, you know, joining uh, small communities, making friends with people, doing honestly stuff like this, like just being willing to talk to people about the stuff that I'm working on and, um, you know, forming relationships. So uh, how do I find the smallest way to build it? I, I try to come up with what I think is the smallest and then determine if there's stuff that I can cut. And then I, I do that frequently throughout the, the project. Like, is there, um, is there stuff that is too complicated that I can actually cut down further? Uh, because the tendency is to always get bigger and more complicated. So having just kind of checkpoints where you try to reverse that a little bit. I have definitely... Mm -hmm reworked and redesigned and refactored these sheets several times um just uh, about a week and a half ago was when i had the idea of splitting this out so i actually reversed out all of these numbers in fact you can still see the sheets here old weapons these were all hand built old armor this was iteration one so like these properties changed um and actually you can see the original like json uh dumped right into one field here uh, when i had more than 24 pieces of armor, I, that's where I overflowed that and had to build this other system. Um, yeah, so let's see, yep. we have any other questions? Well, hopefully that was kind of what you were looking for, um, Renee, and that this was useful for everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop screen sharing, but I can still answer some questions. Uh, how do you decide if a project's worth creating? Um, that's hard. That's another thing for building lots of small games. If you build a small game and it's really fun, um, that's a sign that it might be worth investing more in. And and that happened, that Battle Crypt Bombers game. I still want to go back and make a bigger version of that because we actually made that twice now because we made the first game a long time ago um, that was kind of Nintendo style. And it was the same thing. You throw bombs at each other and... Um, run around and that was pretty much it but it was really fun and then we made it a little bit bigger with battle crypt bombers and now like i want to make it even bigger and and fully release that game because it is like super fun so i guess if you 
um, are play testing and you can't stop, that's a good indicator mm. that your project is worth creating. Like if it's fun accidentally early on, that's a really good sign. If you're like halfway through and you're still trying to make it fun, that's a sign that your project's like unhealthy and in danger. And I see MD has their hand up. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you're gonna look for like um, a publisher for your game, maybe. Uh, would you yeah. also be uh, like interested in maybe setting up your own studio for like a small team of passionate people which you're gonna work with? Um, so technically, I have my own studio. It's just an LLC, mostly for like figuring out tax stuff, so I can isolate my game income from my actual personal income. Um, I'm not really interested in setting up a studio in the real sense unless, well, so let me say this. I have a great job. It's a, it's a huge luxury, which uh, I definitely want to acknowledge up front. And I like my job. So I'm not trying to break into the game industry. There's two things. Um, there's two things that would be cool if they happened. And one thing that I don't want to happen. It would be cool if some people played my game and I made a little bit of money and I invested that in the next game. That's what's happening right now. That's fine. I'm, ha I'm happy building games. I get a little bit of money out of them. I pay people to make music and sound for me for the next game and like stay pretty much flat in terms of income. Um, the other thing that could happen is a game could go really big and sell a ton of copies and make enough money to be actually worth leaving my job. That would also be okay. I don't want to be in the middle where I'm like, where game dev becomes a job that's miserable and I make less than I do right now. That's like the worst outcome. Yeah, so those are kind of like, and, and you know, being in that position is like a huge luxury. So I, like, I realize like that's a really privileged place to be, but those are the outcomes for me. Either this will continue to be a hobby or I'll have a surprise breakout hit and, you know, I'll, I'll go with that, but that's the only way that I would probably walk away from, you know, the job that I have. And um, I, I enjoy my work. I don't really have any reason to leave. And game dev is something that is like really fulfilling and enjoyable for me. And I don't want that to become like a source of stress and, um, you know, work really. <laughs> and um, there's also another thing uh, what you said about if the playtesting is fun and you keep playtesting, that's exactly what happened to League of Legends actually. In their yeah. in their first year or something, uh, after their uh, working hours, instead of like playing other games, they were just playing their builds in their main office for like four hours straight. So, yep. yeah, that's yeah. how Cosmo Squad was for us. We built it to be like Geometry Wars. We both liked Geometry Wars, and so it's kind of like a pixely Geometry Wars. And we would go to play test it, and then uh, we would just kind of keep. Like, oh, one more time. Like, oh, I, I think I could do a little bit higher score. It's like, hold on. I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be building this thing. Yeah. So, um, I mean, Cosmo Squad is not League of Legends. <laughs> but, but, like, I felt really good when we pushed that game to Steam. I was like, this game is fun. If if anybody sees this, they're going to like it. Um, but, like, it just not many people have seen it. <laughs> yeah. And to, to me, it's kind of trying to get to, into that position where the game is fun and you keep on replaying it also has to do with early balancing. It's kind of already when there is just very basic systems and you have the feeling like you have more plans to add, already kind of taking that small bit that you have and tweaking that and making it feel good and getting the movement right. And then I've fallen into this trap as well, especially when I start to do weapon design. I like to make little games that have a bunch of different weapons. And then uh, that just takes me so much time tweaking, but I'm filling all the numbers and it kind of starts to yeah. Yeah, be really engaging just in its limited level. Actually, I had one quick comment about that too. So the way I built Masteroid, the space game that I made, was really interesting. It was kind of crazy and had some, conse like some consequences and downsides, but it is kind of in line with that. I just started building that game one day on a whim. I didn't like set out and plan out, like I'm gonna build this space game and release it on Steam. I just started writing code because I, I wanted to test an idea. Um, excuse me, and and it within a week, it was kind of playable and kind of neat. And I was like, you know what? Yeah. I'm just gonna release this next month. I'm just gonna put it on itch.io. It's like free to, to post a game there. I'll just put it there. And I put it out and then 
I was like, I still want to keep working on this. So I'm going to build these features and then update it next month. And I did that for 16, I think 16 months in a row. Every single month, I published a build to itch. And what that did was it made me, and then eventually um, I, I rolled up all of the, the things and uh, that I had done and published it to Steam. But that made me think of everything that I wanted to build in a one month time frame. So actually that might be a better uh, answer to your, how do you think about building it uh, smaller? That really taught me that, like, I need to build the system. I want to have this idea of missions where you pick up a mission at a space station and you go complete it and you come back and you get something for it. How do you build a mission system in one month? I got to have UI, I've got to have the design, I've got to write the content for the missions, I've got to implement the game mechanics. And every month I solved that problem for a different feature. Now, the downside of that was after two years of that, I had some pretty like spaghetti mess code because I had made like too many shortcuts along the way. But the exercise was extremely valuable in terms yeah. of forcing me every time to think about how do I cut this system down to a buildable chunk. So. Yeah. And that's that kind of the, the, the difference between bottom-up design and, you know, adding one bit at a time or kind of coming from the top down and trying to pre-plan it. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm seeing in, in, in our educational system is because we have these two months blocks and we have kind of a couple of blocks together work towards a game, we, we pre-plan a lot of work. And this also means that all the students get, we, we kind of push you guys into a mindset of trying to plan ahead and kind of think about the broader structure. Um, and what kind of gets lost is that bit of, okay, I've got an idea. I'm just going to create the smallest, insanely smallest possible version of that and and see if I can get that to be engaging. And then I'll add yeah. stuff on top mm -hmm. as I go. And that's um, and that's why I love these kind of a game a week challenges or these kind of things, mm -hmm. because they're so ridiculously small that it kind of, it, it enforces a different mindset. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And those game of like game jam things also help you do that networking thing where you meet the person that fills the gaps in your skill set. You know, those kind of projects are a great way to meet other people that uh, are kind of in your same place. So you don't have to come up with a bunch of, you know, money to pay like a professional. You can kind of start building, you know, your own little team. And that's that's really what's happened. I've been working with Vic for 10 years and some of his friends became my friends, too. And now we have this little group of more people than generally work on a single project, but there's kind of a revolving group of, of skill to draw from. So, yeah. Um, yeah. and sometimes we've paid each other because we could afford to, a lot of times it's just been for fun. But when you're like young and you don't have a lot of income, you know, like using your life savings or whatever to, to pay for professional services is a really dangerous gamble. Uh, so it's good to do that networking and, you know, come up with a passionate team. So, yeah, cool. Are there any uh, final questions for uh, Justin? I think we've. This has been really yes. fun. I'm glad. Um, uh, sorry, Yuri uh, still wants to uh, ask something. Yeah, I, uh, I asked in the chat before, but what was uh, the uh, yeah. the original scope for uh, that project you're 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 working on now? Because uh, I kind of felt the the bridge was uh, I didn't understand the bridge too well from you going to a, a game a month project to uh, realizing you want to make it into a project you want to work on for four months or longer. Yeah, yeah. So the original scope honestly was more of a tech demo. It was like, does this idea of wiggling three sprites work? Does it look good? And I really had gotten there within a week and then I kept playing with it for a little bit longer than that. And I got to the point where I had guys that could walk around and attack with a weapon and it was just kind of all hard-coded and that was the point and that happened last november where i said i want to make this into a game and um then i had i mean you can see in this old um well I, i'm not screen sharing anymore but i in this these old sheets i had about 30 weapons and about 20 pieces of armor so i had to get enough stuff in there to see what it felt like to get loot um and i reached that by, so I, basically, I keep hitting benchmarks, and then I move the goalposts a little bit. So I am still trying to keep scope small, even though it looks like scope is like really big now because there's like hundreds of weapons. Um, I I have reached benchmarks of okay, I want to put in 
20 pieces of armor, 20 weapons, and I want to be able to fight through a dungeon and come back and sell the stuff I got and buy more stuff. That's the game. That's and then the I got yep. there. And and I'm actually right at near the end of a milestone right now. So I was like, I, I've got uh, all of this art. I came up with this idea of weapon materials and then quality levels. I need to get to a point where I have a lot of those combinations. So you basically multiply out, you know, there's six weapon uh, types. There's five weapon materials. There's six quality levels. That's X number of total weapons. I go do that art. I get those all into the sheet. They're into the game. I, I just hit that milestone. So now I'm at this point where I, I have a vendor where you can buy and sell, a vendor where you can upgrade items, vendors where you can upgrade health and mana. I have three maps, one for each biome. I want that full gameplay loop in. I want to be able to run through multiple dungeons in a row, come back, sell my weapons, feel what it likes, feels like to level up. Ask myself, are we having fun? I know that we are because my kids keep wanting to play it. Like they keep saying, hey, can we play test the game tonight? Once that feels good, then the next thing for me is those abilities. That'll be the next like scope of work and the next increase. But these are not runaway scope. These are like the next milestone is this and I get there and then I move the goalposts. Um, so it is I feel like it is still controlled and constrained growth of the idea. Um, and when I start feeling like the game is big enough to ship, then I'll be a little bit more aggressive about figuring out what shipping means. If I'm finding a publisher or self-publishing, um, I feel like I want to be done with this game this year. I have not set a specific time that I want to work on it. The next thing is abilities. When I start feeling how those feel, I'll know how long I want to work on them. Is that two months, probably about two months. Then, um, in the meantime, I'll also be probably adding more maps and feeling how that feels. And then that'll help me decide how many maps should this game have per biome. Um, but I'm pretty close to feature complete, like, which is a little bit beyond systems complete. Um, that will be when abilities are all in, everything has nice particle effects, and I've got sound in. Then the game will be done, and after that, it's all polished. And actually, one important thing about that, Vic and I have a rule of thumb that if you want to ship in 10 months, the game needs to be feature complete in five. Whatever your mm. target date to be done, if you were building a one-month game, game's got to be playable and have pretty much everything in in two weeks. Um, and then everything after that is polished and actually fixing all the things that you broke building it. All right, that was very clear. Thank you. Um, Thanks. One person had asked, streaming the development. I don't uh, stream on like Twitch or YouTube. I just, it's super off the cuff. I'm, I don't have the schedule to be like disciplined about times. Um, the flat red ball that uh, Renee had linked at the beginning, that website has a Discord link. I hang out in that Discord pretty much all the time. Um, there's quite a few uh, seasoned programmers that just hang out there. Conversation is about game dev about 5% of the time. It can be about anything, <laughs> arguing about cryptocurrency or what. Like there's a thousand things that we always argue about. Uh, but um, I just, if I'm on and I'm working, I a lot of times just stream into the Discord channel. Oh. Yeah, we always argue about whatever stuff, whatever's in the news. If it's Bitcoin, if it's GameStop stock running away, we're in there like arguing about it. <laughs> Right. Well, cool. Thanks for uh, for joining today. I think this is what I really liked about this is how you how you could show like in a very practical sense how you get from nothing to to building a, a full on action RPG and constantly keeping scope in mind and mm -hmm. constantly trying to push yourself to learn new things and grow bigger, but still in a step by step fashion and not taking off more than you can chew. Um, that's all. Uh, keep an eye out on. Uh, I think you have a Twitter, or let's make sure we we uh, wish list uh, uh, we RPG on Steam, so the algorithm has got a little bit of a push. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know when it will even be on there. Um, so the Narfox Studios is my games account. I probably, if people want to ask questions or ping me personally, my my personal uh, Twitter is probably uh, more responsive. 
Um, I sometimes abandon Narfox Studios for like weeks or months when I'm like too busy to think about marketing. So that's more my marketing one. My uh, personal one is um, the one I actually respond to a little bit more. Oh. Is that me? I don't think that's no, me. No, I'm sorry. I'm getting the wrong one. This is another yeah. Justin. This is the musician. Yeah, that guy's amazing too. My friend always sends me uh, his stuff and says, how come you aren't this good? <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of friends that I have. Uh, that's right. My, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And thanks so much for joining. I'll make sure uh, we uh, we send the stream uh, uh, your way. And okay. um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll be in touch. Maybe we'll find another moment to uh, to do something together. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you all for coming. Cool. Thanks a lot. Right. Yep, we'll Thank you. you.